everyone. Welcome to the Artilus webinar series. My name is Sharice Ruan, Digital Marketing Manager at Artilus. Thank you for joining us for Securing Your Remote Workforce Must-Haves to Do It Right. Today we're joined by Artilus Principal Cyber Engineer Seth Simmons and Microsoft's U.S. National Director of Modern Work and Security, Mr. Phil West, to provide insight into how you can build a more secure remote or hybrid work environment. Feel free to submit your questions during the webinar at any time, and they will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Please note that if we do not get to your question during today's session, an Artilus representative will reach out to you to answer your question directly. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you after today's session. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please email marketing at artilus.com. Now I'd like to turn it over to Seth and Phil. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Seth Simmons. Um, from Artilist, um, and uh, just a quick kind of top line of uh, what Artilist is. So uh, the name is actually a mashup of the words uh, ardent, um, meaning to have passion, being fervent, zealous, and uh, catalyst. So something that um, causes or brings change. Um, Artilist believes in a threat-based approach to cybersecurity and defense. Uh, to help solve the challenges um, by aligning threat uh, with traditional business operations. And really our primary goal is to help clients protect and expand their competitive edge um, and to be able to succeed in a highly competitive digital world. Um, and we believe in a future uh, where organizations can succeed in that digital world by replacing uncertainty with understanding. Um, we build state-of-the-art solutions uh, to secure and streamline um, businesses with our partners such as FireEye, Gigamon, and Microsoft, uh, which is especially relevant today um, because we've got Phil West from Microsoft joining us. Thank you, Seth. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, that we have to kind of discuss this, and I really would like to make sure today is more of a discussion. So, um, you know, Seth, as you have as you have feedback or you have personal experiences or or projects that you know of, please let please make make sure they they're relevant and and that you keep me on track today. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't promise about keeping on track. Well, that's true. That's We've true. got an hour. So that's like true. if we start going down a rabbit hole, but it is a good discussion, yeah. that, that, that's <laughs> what happens. I, absolutely. And is, and Sharice, thank you for taking care of uh, kind of the, the logistics on this as well as the Q&A. So folks, uh, I'm sure you're going to have questions on this. Um, we may actually get onto a topic. We may use a term that you're not familiar with. And uh, it's only because of uh, laziness on our side. So if you have a question, please make sure you let us know um one of the things that um you know that, that's actually so relevant today is we talk about you know I, i've heard this remote work i've heard hybrid work i've heard return to work return to the workplace uh relocating the workplace i really think in the situation that we're in today and moving forward there there, there may not be a single term that can define what we're facing today. Uh, not only from a personal safety perspective, your family and your loved ones, but also how do we keep conducting business? How do, how do we maintain in this crazy world that we live in today, how do we maintain the ability to do what's right for our family and for our business, uh, to meet our employer and have our employers meet us where we need to be? So if that means a, a hybrid work environment, I've talked to customers that say, listen, we're, uh, we're staying at home you know, 100% of the time. I've had customers tell me, hey, we're trying to get everybody back in the office we can. Every business is different. That's why I don't think there's any one good moniker, nor is there one good uh, recipe that's going to fit everybody in every every scenario. So we really are trying to figure out how do we just figure out what is that hybrid model look like? And that's a spectrum. It's not, it's not a, it's not a one size fits all. So we actually have three things that we have to really worry about. And we worry about them from a lens of riskiness, of exposure. Um, the first of all, you can see on the left, is where we're gonna do work. So we used to have kind of the confines of an office and kind of some sort of probably a false sense of security, but we had a mechanism of, of 
of oversight um, that we have really kind of given up. We don't have the perimeter. Um, literally, we don't have a traditional potential firewall like we originally had. Um, we, we're having customers that are having to do their business from far, far flung, whether that be because of personal issues, because of work safety issues, because of just normal business that, uh, you know, that takes you traveling, period. Uh, we also think about the, the tools that are being used. We used to have used to have a lot of tools that were very much on-prem. You'd VPN back in. You could set some sort of boundary and security that way because you were virtually inside uh, of your of your brick and mortar. And that's that's really kind of a uh, a process that's kind of evolving as well. And then finally, how do we do work? How, what is the data that we're having to work on now? What are our customers having to face? Um, we live in a world where cyber threats are, you know, are just becoming the normal thing on TV. I, I can remember years ago when people would talk about ransomware or they would talk about viruses. Uh, you know, first of all, I think, you know, most of my family would call me and say, what in the world does that mean? What are they talking about? It's odd now that you, you talk about cybersecurity and, you know, our, our our parents and our our aunts and uncles and and so many other folks actually know what that means and it's actually becoming relevant because it's becoming discussed at so many levels i mean so you've got like uh even tv series that are completely based <laughs> around so let's csi cyber um mm -hmm. that aside no so you've got like mr robot showing like no look what like one a couple people in the right place with just the taking advantage of the right things can do to a network to an individual to your data and like it's sure it's been kind of hollywoodized but like sure. no a lot of the tools that they're using are actual things that exist Absolutely. You know, that's the thing about it is we I, I do love I do love some because I, I, you know, I watch these some of these shows and I'm probably like most of you on the call as I look at them and go, well, that's not exactly how you do that or you can't really do that. But um, what what was fanciful five years ago, three years ago is becoming much more prevalent today with, you know, with the ability of doing things like machine learning and artificial intelligence, being able to create uh, new social engineering ways to to try to infiltrate. And all of a sudden now you've got workers that are far flung, which means workers are disconnected to some degree. So you've got the employee experience that's kind of broken. Uh, not everybody's gathering around, you know, the coffee pot in the morning, eating donuts and discussing or going to their morning meeting where everybody's in the conference room. We're all virtualizing all of that. There's positives and negatives, but all of a sudden you got to realize that now, you know, it's a it's a different paradigm to go to work, especially if you have to think about cyber and and think about security. I, you were mentioning TV shows, and I can remember years ago, I got in I got interested in security because I watched War Games. I thought War Games, and I still think War Games is a great movie. Oh, yeah. uh, if you haven't seen it, go try it. But it was one of those things. It was like back then, it was like that that literally was legit hacking. You know, in a, in a weird sense of the term, hacking. I just wonder today, like, what are our customers going to face in five years? I mean, that's always what I think about. I'm like, hey, I think we've got really good stories now. But I also worry about, like, if I can help you now, I want to be able to help you in a year, in two years, in three years. I mean, that, I think that's where Microsoft and Arvis share this concept of, listen, this is an ever-changing landscape. It's not like you just check a box one time and you're good. Uh, if, if the if the threats stopped changing and stopped advancing, then sure. But that's not going to happen as long as there are people that. And so, granted, like it, it's not always malicious from a I'm trying to do this to hurt you. Right. Um, it it is still malicious, but it is I'm trying to do this purely because of the challenge. Like, and I mean, back to war games or hackers, it was, I'm doing this because of a challenge, but even that can still have an impact to your network. And it, it as long as there are people out there that are like, I'm going to see what I'm, what I can do just for my own personal True. gratification. What can I do? 
as long as there's people like that, there's always going to be an evolving threat. So you can't yep. just, yep, I'm good, and hope that that's going to save you from now until, like, you're done. Exactly. And and we also think about it, you know, we always think about security and, and cyber threats as somebody that's trying to break in from the outside. And I think one of the things that we've come across and it's a it's a common buzzword, but it, there's a reality to it. And that's what we call zero trust, which is basically, listen, hey, I actually have to worry about my employees and the data they have access to, their identities and the data they can get access to. How do I protect that? And, and in many cases, we've seen where I call them kind of like skunk works IT, which is, hey, I need to I need to collaborate with, let's say, an external partner or something. So rather than going through my approved way of sharing and, and tracking and, and locating files and, and having encryption done, I'll just throw them on my own, like my own Dropbox, or, or I'll, I'll put them on G Drive or whatever it might be. And it, it actually, not necessarily as nefarious, it's just, hey, it's a, it, I, I've got a challenge, I wanna do it the easiest, quickest way. I know how I've done this before because I've shared out 3,000 pictures with my family of the wedding. So here's the easy way to go do this. And, and I think sometimes we also have to understand that, you know, one of the challenges we've got is how do I make sure that my employees, as, as your customers, how do I make sure that those employees have everything they need to be super productive, yet I don't give them so much flexibility that it allows them to do something that actually kind of pulls their rug out from under themselves. And that's really where we get with this zero trust, which is, is three phases of that. It's really, I'm assuming no trust. And that's what zero trust means. I'm assuming no trust until it is needed and justified, which means to the left, verify explicitly. I want to know who you are. And, and you know, and that's one of the things that is it's so common now. It's everybody says, hey, I've got users and I, I get I make them have passwords and I, I make them have all these convoluted passwords and I make them change those passwords, you know, every, every so often. The problem with that is is that we've actually come to the point where passwords are really not reliable enough because once I steal one of your passwords, now I can go to multiple machines, try to try to use that access and try to determine how can I attack from multiple vectors. Uh, so it's not just, hey, knowing that, it's, it's also the middle one, which is giving them out the least privilege as possible. And I, I'm gonna say this is kind of like just in time, just enough access. So uh, I, I draw the analogy, it's like, hey, if I need to get access to some information, if I don't use that information on a routine basis, let's say it's financial analysis data for the entire United States, whatever it might be. If I'm not in the team that does that a lot, and I only use this maybe once a quarter when they have to do reports, maybe I don't need access to it globally all the time. Maybe I just need access at a certain time, and maybe I need to request access in order to get it or go through multiple steps. Um, and again, when I mentioned this, multiple steps, obviously just like with verifying identity, multi-factor authentication is like one of the most foundational pieces we can put together. Absolutely. It is, literally is get away from a password or if you use a password, just make that the first gate you have to go through and then you fire off multi-factor authentication. There's a number of solutions. Microsoft offers solutions. But the most important thing is not necessarily who you buy them from, it's how you implement them and how you monitor them um, and how you trigger them. Uh, you know, it could be the fact that, hey, it's Phil West. Phil West comes in and sitting in a company owned laptop. Uh, I'm VPNed into the company, but for whatever, whatever situation is, is at hand, I start doing something that's not my normal thing. I start scanning for stuff, I start trying to do privileged access, I'm doing RPC, I could be doing a number of things. All of a sudden, if I don't have an awareness of that, I could do a legal operation, but if I do it 10,000 times at two o'clock in the morning on Sunday, now I've triggered, hey, this is not how Phil operates. Number one, Phil is not a night owl. <laughs> Phil lives on the East Coast, and Phil tries not to work on the weekends. You know, we all try not to. So it's it's a situation where that last one is, I have to determine at some point in time, I'm going to have some sort of breach. I think this is this is where we have to swallow a very bitter pill and say, you know what? 
we could put together the best plan in the world. We could execute it literally almost flawlessly. But look, just like you, you said before, the assumption is I've executed it flawlessly as of a certain time on September the 8th. And guess what? All of a sudden, some sort of you know, exposure comes out, some risk mitigating factor comes out. And all of a sudden, if I don't adjust to that in an ever changing way, I'm going to get hacked. So, it, it, you know, it's one of those things we always say, hey, the security folks, we have to be right all the time. Hackers only have to be right one time to get in yeah. and, and really cause grief. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we look at zero trust from a Microsoft lens. So we look at zero trust, and I kind of mentioned this before. We're going to go around the, you know, verifying least privilege and assuming breach. We kind of break it up a little bit. So we have to the left under verifying in identities and endpoints. So not only the human individual, but the device that they're on. So we want to be able to make sure we monitor and control both of those. When I say controlling, the endpoint doesn't necessarily have to be a corporate-owned device. It could be a you know BYOD, bring your own device, a personal device. And I would have some sort of mechanism to create a policy on there to create what we consider to be called a corral, like a data corral, where applications and data can be there. And if necessary, we have the ability from the corporate to go back and extricate that data, wipe it, or do whatever we need to to help secure that device. How many of you have ever been in a, a cab heading to the airport? You leave a laptop, you leave something behind, you know, hopefully not I, your phone, but you can, you I, know. I've, I've left a laptop. Uh, yeah. going going through TSA because yeah. you have to put every everything has to go in bins and Absolutely. I had like six bins because I had <laughs> multiple computers and stuff and I happened to have like one of the new MacBooks which is super thin and so yep. I was like pulling things out and just stacking bins on top of bins and I put all the empty bins sure. on top yeah. of the bin that had the MacBook in it which it it didn't it didn't look funny because the computer was so thin and yeah. I, I, I left yeah. the laptop on my yeah. way out. That, yeah. you know, that's happened so many times. And, you know, it's one of those things that it's going to happen. Nobody means for it to happen, the, but it's such a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you realize, you know, not only is it a very expensive item and it's a heck of an inconvenience to have to lose one, but secondarily, you know, it's, it's like, wait a minute, there's a lot of data on there. So how do I make sure that that the Phil West identity, as well as the Phil West or the Seth Simmons laptop, is being protected and is being secured? So that's that's really kind of one piece of this. In the middle of using the least privilege, there's a there's a policy enforcement we have to get to. And, and I tell people this: the only way that I can create a policy, like a rule, and enforce it, is if I have some very discreet things that I'm looking for. Anybody that's ever taken like a computer programming class, you know, there's the if then statement, you know, if something happens, then something else should occur, whatever it might be. I keep thinking in the back of my mind, our customers have got to look at their data as like money. I mean, just look at it as like a treasure. Maybe it's like, a, you know, Scrooge McDuck, if you've got the, the gold coins or whatever they are mounted up on your desk. Think of that as a treasure. Think of that also as a way of saying, hey, I've got bits and pieces of information. Some are more worth more than the others. Uh, some are more rare than the others, whatever they might be. So I need to have classifications that I can put on them. I need to understand how I can label them properly and then do something based on those labels. And I draw the analogy to this. If we start from the left-hand side and we work our way over, it's like, okay, if I see Phil West at a, you know, he's at a Starbucks on an Android device that I've never seen before. I don't control it. It's not registered to me, but Phil's on an Android device. Maybe Phil bought a new laptop or you know a new tablet or something. I come to the middle and I say, okay, Phil's a cool guy. I know Phil, I can trust Phil, but I don't know anything about his device. He's not on a corporate network. He's not even aware where I've seen him on a corporate network. He's not in his home. He's out at a public Wi-Fi and you know, all of a sudden now I can start looking and saying, okay, well, based on that, if Phil wants to look at those financial records that he looks at once a quarter, I might just make a determination, you know, hey, you know, this looks like it might be a, a decent way to feel working, but let me just verify. So I might fire off multi-factor authentication right then to say, okay, 
it's Phil. I know it's Phil. Phil's already, you know, put his password in. He's on a device, a little sketchy, never seen it before. Nothing against Android. I've just never seen it before. He's not registered it. Um, let me just go ahead and fire off MFA just to be sure. So I do an MFA. I might send it, for example, if, you know, if, if you're me, you know, you get an alert on your phone. Hey, here's the situation. You have to verify it with some, with a piece of data and some code. And then you go back and say, yeah, this is me. Yes or no, whatever. Now, all of a sudden, I can make some determinations around that security policy that's in the middle. And then what I need to do then is determine, OK, once I've once I've created a policy and by the way, the policy should never be wide open or 100 percent closed. That, the policy should be very granular to say, you know what, Phil, at a public Wi-Fi on an unknown device, he's passed MFA, so I will let him view certain data on the right run certain applications on the right, have access to certain infrastructure on the right, but I might make limitations on it. For example, that financial information that Phil's looking for. Maybe what I do is I put that in a container that allows for viewing, but nothing else. And this goes back all the way back to that endpoint discussion of how much control do I have over that endpoint? If I don't have a way in which I can containerize it for that endpoint and prevent things like copy paste or whatever, I might make a decision, you know what, Phil, I, I know you're supposed to get access to this. I know you probably deem it. I don't have enough control over your endpoint. You're sitting in a suspicious location. I'm not going to let you see that data. I'll let you run an app like charging up your expenses or registering vacation time or whatever, but I'm not going to let you see a personal piece of data. Now, I'll let you see your spreadsheet on your fantasy football. I got that, but I'm not going to let you see this other type of data. So all of a sudden now... I have to have enough levers to make some decisions. And that is a huge part of where we break down in security is we don't have the data, our treasures, properly labeled and properly classified so that we can make these really smart decisions. So all of a sudden we get to, it's either wide open or 100% closed. And by the way, neither of those is, is really the, the right solution. It's gotta be somewhere in between because this hybrid workforce issue, this is not just like, hey, we're gonna limp along for three months and we'll be back to the way it was. I don't think we're ever going back to the way it was. This new hybrid is the way it is going forward. I mean, Seth, are you seeing a lot of the same situations where you're where you're getting uh, you're getting called for breaches or or you know customers that that have these similar issues? It's uh, like we are seeing um, a lot of. Um, we'll call it distributed networks, maybe is the, the best way to say it now. That, um, yes, here is where the main business is slash was, but now we also have like satellite campuses type things, um, which, I mean, even kind of the big air quotes, the way it was, um, even then it would, I would argue it was, it was still a hybrid environment it's just that the for i think a lot of of uh networks it's just that the amount of people that had the privilege of being able to work from home or from not in the office um because they they met the right wickets and you're important enough to need a laptop to be able to be on call whenever so that you can get into these resources the number of that people was a whole lot lower but it still existed and it was still an issue that needed to be addressed yeah i you know i i see us actually going to a point where and, and i've thrown some stats up on the screen i mean you know, I've seen it where reliance upon passwords uh, has been one of those. Hey, we got passwords. We make you change them every 30 days, whatever it is. Well, that you I know, just change the one to a two, and then the two to a three. And yeah, three exactly. to a four. I, I'm I, I replaced all the the S's with fives, or you know, it's it's like all of a sudden I got to be honest with you folks. Uh, quite honestly, password you know guessing algorithms uh, are, are probably so sophisticated that most passwords can be cracked just by brute force attack. Uh, and if I do any sort of social engineering on you, I, I can, you know, the last thing in the world is put using dates in there. I can find when your daughter was born. 
I can figure out from Facebook that you have a dog named Chief. I, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can try to figure out. So I tell people this, you know, a password is literally just like it's the weakest form of security. Uh, and it's by the way, it's the easiest to get stolen. And then, by the way, all I have to do is figure out how to put a keylogger on a machine and I can just watch you type in your password. So, I mean, it's that. But there's also this this proliferation of bring your own devices. And I'm not against BYOD. Um, I'm actually all for BYOD with the right security. And I've seen so many customers who say, yeah, I just have my email and, and I get uh, my Office 365 email. I just get it through the, the iOS app, the email app on iOS. Um, and I tell people this, it's like nothing against Apple at all. I actually have an iOS phone. The issue is there's not really any policy enforcement that I can say. So, so one of the things we mentioned before is those applications and those applications allow me to create the right level of bring your own device security so that I can have my customers understand, hey, you can absolutely use your iOS, your Android phones, use the application, like for example, use the Outlook application because it understands and abides by those labels and those enforcement policies whereas some other apps don't. And most customers don't wanna go in and say, well, you can't connect your Apple email client to Office 365. You can't do that because it's not secure. They're not gonna make that determination because they don't want to disrupt the, the, the employee's experience and the flexibility. And I totally understand that. I wanna protect that flexibility. I wanna protect their productivity. But I also realize I have a responsibility back to my company to say, if they're using an application that I can't extend enforcement of policy to, then all of a sudden I have poked this huge giant hole in this firewall that I'm trying to build and nobody's there to watch it and nobody's there to secure it. So this is where we, we go into our four steps uh, of how do, we, how do we determine the best case for our hybrid work. So left to right, it's kind of similar to how we've been talking about before. We look at identity and endpoint management and say, okay, we have to have a, a modern way of looking at what are the identity and endpoint management challenges and how do we solve them? We have to secure the hybrid workforce. So we have to say, hey, we know we're gonna have hybrid workers, whether they be in the office. I, I know I've had some customers say, we're gonna go, you know, we, we might say that, hey, we go to shifts. And if you're on the A shift, you go to the office on Mondays. If you're B, you go on Tuesdays, whatever, I, you know, however you however they want to do it. I, I've yet to see any two customers that have exactly the same policy or exactly the same workforce mix. And then number three is what we have to do is we can't forget this all is all about the employees and how the employees have to do their work. So very few of, of, of the end customers that we end up talking to very few of them is what's your, what is your how do you how do you bring the cash register how do you pay the bills and keep the lights on well we run a very secure infrastructure <laughs> not, not it. you know they they make something they sell something they provide services whatever it and don't take me the wrong way it is a cost of doing business and it's actually a very big cost of doing business it can actually make productivity skyrocket but or it also, tank or tank exactly that's what i worry about is that customers are saying yeah we're going to pour all of this technology in to our hybrid workforce and not think about security built in from day one and that's why the right hand side says hey let's figure out how we customize access for all user types that means administrators executives i mean i'll be honest with you executives sometimes are some of the hardest ones to corral because they don't want to have any cumbersome any 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 encumbrance on their flexibility they want to be able to do anything they can however they want to do it i get it i i understand that I, i've had to deal with them believe me and then there's there, there's an understanding though if, if they understand this is what it affects in terms of your business model your bottom line and your risk exposure all of a sudden you start putting it into hard numbers and they realize okay this is a business decision. this isn't just well, you can't use your Dropbox for, you know, sharing out everything with your, you know, your other, you know, customers. But no, it, there's a reason behind it. And the problem is humans generally go back to the last thing that served them. So if like, if, like I mentioned before, if you were sharing 
tons of, of wedding photos out using Dropbox. I have nothing against Dropbox. You're sharing them out, whatever. All of a sudden, you've got to share out this huge document. And um, you know, maybe you're like, man, I don't even know if our email system will handle a 22 meg file, whatever. Like, I'll just I'll send them a link, you know. And, and it's it's nothing nefarious. It's just hmm, it's just the last thing that I did. I know it's easy. I'll throw it in there. Boom, it's ready to go. I don't have to worry about it. Um, it, so one it, thing it's like what you were saying before that like with security solutions like you can't be wide open and you can't be 100 percent closed right like if the solution is too difficult like makes productivity makes just working too difficult for employees so that transforming employee experiences versus like making Kind of customized for what you're looking for if it's too difficult people are gonna try to find a way around it <laughs> absolutely if, if yeah. you can't email a a document that is more than three megs total and i'm not even a document like total attachments has right. to be less than three megs i'm gonna find a way to get this i, I have a pdf right. that is huge and it has images or a powerpoint that right. has images in it, and it's gonna be more than three megs. I have to get this out. I have a deadline. I'm right. gonna do what I have to do to meet this deadline. Guess what? I'm bypassing security because this has to go out. And it, it was never meant as an intentional breach, but nevertheless, it's a breach. I mean, and I, now it's out there. Yeah. And how many times have you seen where, well, a, a certain you know certain data sets or a database was discovered? with customer information on it about companies such and such all of a sudden I, I don't think in the back of my mind anybody said hey you know the easiest thing we do is just put this on the wild wild internet and let everybody have it. i don't think anybody intentionally did it it was either oversight or as i mentioned before sometimes it's laziness sometimes it really is i can't there's no way around this or i don't want to have to figure out how do i send a secure attachment out of my company so I'm just going to do it the old way that I know. For I example, know this works. Yeah. Just for example, when we we were working on this uh, slide presentation together, you know, I went from my company and I said, okay, on my OneDrive, I shared out and I said, okay, Charisse, Seth, here's the here's the file. I'm going to share it with you. You guys take a look at it. We collaborated on it. They they made some edits. They changed it. They shared it back with me so that we can start working and looking at this. And we did it all through a OneDrive. Everything was tracked. It was audited. We had these one-time passcodes. Everybody was kind of wrapped up that we knew, okay, nothing super secret in here, but who knows? There could have been. It wasn't labeled as sensitive, but we wanted to make sure we could share this the right way. That's actually, that's actually, you know, it, it took a little bit of effort to do that the right way. And sometimes it goes back to just employee education. Sometimes it's just, oh, I didn't know I could do that, or I didn't know I was supposed to do that. So we, we think about this as a, as a mechanism. And again, transforming this employee experience is important. There's education that goes into that so that they're aware of the power that they have in that data. I mentioned before, if we could just get our minds around data as being Scrooge McDuck and the gold coins, I've got some really, really cool gold coins and I need to get them to a partner. I need to get them to whomever. I'm working on this. It's very valuable. How do I do it the right way versus just putting them in an envelope, putting them in the post box, and hoping the mail person gets them to the other end? I mean, that's that's kind of the the that's kind of the the way we're trying to to deal with this. So we start out. Our first step is okay. How do we? What do we do about our identity and endpoint management? So one of the biggest things that most of, uh, of you are dealing with right now is security has to go up. We have to have higher levels of security, but guess what? Budgets aren't always going up. In fact, security, as I mentioned before, not very many of, of, the, of the customers I talk to, they're not ringing their cash registers. They're not getting money by being secure. Being secure is table stakes. It's like, that's an expectation. Whether you're be government, education, manufacturing, retail, you know, consulting services, legal, whatever. It's overhead. It I, is. Need, I need to do yeah. this because a lot of times it's, I need to do this because I have to, it's a requirement. And, and I don't want to get on the front page of the newspaper. 
and I'm dating myself by call, talking about newspapers. I don't want to get on the front page of, you know, whatever the news du jour that you, you work at. I don't want to be you, on Facebook. You don't, I don't, you don't want, want to be, be on, trending on Twitter. Yeah, I don't want to be nobody tweeting about how I, you know, I breached data and my company. And you see that. I mean, I can't tell you how many times. And believe me, I, I see, you know, stuff internally pretty quickly on, hey, this is what's a, this is a known threat that's been identified. Uh, so and so had a data leak. And so I, you know, getting that information and just thinking back myself, you know, I know the feeling that they're going through, not to the degree they're going through. I've never, I've never had a breach that was, that was anything close to it. I actually worked in the private sector for a long time, responsible for a lot of data in the financial services market. But the problem was at that point in time, there was, you know, there was very few hacks. This was the, this was the word games era. So people <laughs> had to literally hack in, you know, now, it's so easy because there's so much out there that's available. So part of our problem is, okay, let's start with that community and say this. The first things we do is we modernize authentication and looking at identities in the cloud. So we have, you know, many of you, if you've had on-premise solutions, you may have something called Active Directory that sits on a domain controller. It's kind of your yellow pages, if you think about it. It's okay, here's who's who. Here's how you get in touch with them. Here's, you know, maybe their phone number, their nicknames. Hey, here's some stuff about them that you might want to know about. Uh, you know, here's a special section over here about people who have special services to offer, you know, contracting, painting, whatever it might be. So you think about Active Directory as your yellow pages. Now think about pursuing Active Directory in the cloud, which means now what I'm doing is I'm actually creating a mechanism for cloud services to utilize a single identity. So think about it this way. If I'm Phil West and I log in, it'd be super good if everything I ever touched inside of Microsoft didn't ask me for a username and a password all over again, okay? So that concept of being able to do single sign-on is crucial. Imagine if I also said, you know what, Phil? Uh, there's a reason that you're going to do this. There's a reason you're going to need to reach out and maybe use a third party tool that's not a Microsoft product. Guess what? We realize not everybody uses everything from Microsoft. Bingo. You, there's tons of applications out there that everybody needs to use. So I'll put, I'll pick one, Salesforce. It's like, hey, Phil, it'd be great. Once you authenticate into Microsoft, it'd be great if you didn't have to do anything special when you authenticated into Salesforce. In other words, if Microsoft internal trusts me and they validated me, I should have a link that says, hey, by the way, you can now trust this and have a single sign-on experience. All of a sudden now we've, I've gotten my authentication uh, uplifted. I have an identity mechanism that can actually now spray across multiple SaaS applications and be used. Now the problem is this, if I do that, I've actually said, hey, if you break into Phil's identity, boom, you have access to all the stuff that Phil had access to. You are that's... now Phil. Yeah, man, and that's a scary topic right there. You're Phil. I mean, it, you got to think about it. Now I got to figure out, okay, just being Phil, quote unquote, knowing Phil's username and password is not enough. I now look at the device itself and I say, hey, these are devices that Phil knows about. I've got devices that my company issued me, Surface devices, for example. I've got my iPhone, that's a personal device. Uh, I've got a tablet, that's a personal device, but I wanna be able to work on all of them. So there's a concept of in, in, in our endpoint management solution, which says, I want to enroll this device. So in other words, hey, here's my own personal iPhone. It's kind of an older one, it's a seven, but hey, it still works, it's still fine. I enroll it into uh, our Intune product, and I say, hey, this is Phil, I authenticate, I do all the nice stuff, and it sends down a policy. It sends a policy to my phone, it says, hey, we're gonna make sure we do some certain things for this. For example, you gotta have a lockout timer, uh, it's gotta be a six-digit pin, for example, blah, blah, blah. It's gonna fire off at so many minutes. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to, to make statements like, you can't connect your uh, iOS mail app to Office 365. You need to use the built-in client, which is the Outlook mobile client, excuse me, the native client, I meant, the Outlook mobile client to actually access your Office 365 because we can then, because so much information goes through email. It's unbelievable how much stuff we put into email. And then all of a sudden now we look at the right-hand side and that actually extends into what I was mentioning before about application management. What apps can I use? 
it would probably be very smart for me not to be able to, to open up an email that says Microsoft Confidential and copy and paste any information into the Twitter app. That's probably going to be a good rule that I shouldn't do that. So I'm going to have to have, con just like I had data classification labels, I'm going to have to have classification on how do I think about applications. And to, quite honestly, nothing against anybody, probably don't trust Facebook, probably don't trust Twitter, probably don't trust Instagram, and, and I'm probably missing some of the TikTok or some of the, you know, there's, there's this whole foray of information. I probably don't also say, hey, you can copy out of my OneDrive application and move a file over and put it into, let's say, a, a drop, a, a personal Dropbox. It's like I might, I might have like a corporate Dropbox or something you have to go through. So I, I want to be able to do application verification as well. This is really crucial. This is not easy, okay? I'm gonna tell you that, it's not easy. Uh, number two, it's not fun, okay? So this, this requires somebody to go and figure out what apps are being used, what are my exposure points, how much information could be shared, Obviously, in Twitter, I probably, I think I can only get 120 characters. I don't know if that's changed or not. I'm not a big Twitter person, but. That, that, that's just one tweet, though. You can you can do a whole. Oh, that's right. I could break them up. Okay, get a, you should do one of, and then I'm thinking, keep going. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking maybe I can only do 120 characters worth of damage at a time, but you're right. I could start chewing these things up. Maybe you can do a whole, like a whole novel, just 120 characters at a time. At a time. Yeah. Please don't, please don't ever write a novel like that. That would be unbelievable. But the problem is, I have, to, I have to determine what are the channels that make sense for me. So I mentioned Azure Active Directory gives me, number one, my identities. It gives me a place to do authentication. Uh, it can actually block legacy authentications, the old world authentication. It can force things like conditional access. So it can push things like multi-factor authentication. And for those customers that still have an on-premise Active Directory, we can actually connect that Active Directory on-premise to your Active Directory in the cloud. It's called Azure Active Directory. We can connect the two of them so that there's a bi-directional sync that it can happen. It allows us to have this cloud sync so that if anything you knew about on-prem, I can replicate that identity up. And if I delete you, if I, you know, if you quit the business or whatever, I can make sure that those any of those on-prem changes get synchronized up in the cloud. So that's like a that's like a a first step in in preparing for this. It's kind of like uh, modernizing your your endpoints, basically. Yeah, it's ba basically it's you, and, and you think about a human is kind of an endpoint. It's like I've got I've got I've got, I've got to handle my humans, and then with endpoint manager here, I'm handling a device. Like for example, I could have devices that are you know I could have obviously we want you to have a lot of Windows devices, but we know that's not the case. People have Mac OS, they have Linux. They have Android stuff. Got it. Here's the deal is we also want to be able to say, how can we help to look at those devices and make sure that they're secure as well? Just as I mentioned before, we have something called Configuration Manager. That's out of the System Center portfolio. It's on the left-hand side. You'll see that very much in on-premise clients and servers. You'll see a lot of that technology kind of sitting there. If you've got servers on-prem, if you've got desktops on-prem, that's probably a way that you, you've handled that configuration before. Microsoft Intune was actually built as that endpoint manager in the cloud. So much like Active Directory and Azure Active Directory, this is kind of like Config Manager and then Intune. Intune being an umbrella that actually looks at not only on-prem, but actually can extend all the way up to clouds and cloud management, supports things like iOS, Android, and so now, now Configuration Manager also supports Mac OS and, and, and others. But Intune supports things like mobile devices, like iOS and Android devices. So you can think of Config Manager being back with Mac OS and Linux. And then Microsoft Intune supports all of those plus mobile operating systems, iOS and Android, for, for example. So one of the things we also want to talk about is as we bring these two together, this is one piece of the puzzle. This is just the first step in bring, oh, I'm sorry, in bringing these together. So the second piece is how do I secure that hybrid workforce? Guess what? Majority of the executives are super scared about what's happening in cyber. Plain and simple. Nobody is like, wow, this whole cyber thing is getting easier by the day. I don't have any customers coming at me and going, you know, Phil, 
I've got too much security in place. I need to leave. I need to lessen my security posture. I, I've yet to get that phone call. I get a lot of phone calls that, uh, you know, I need to figure out how I sharpen the pencil on my budget and I do better and I do more things in a better way. And we're absolutely happy. Artless is absolutely happy to get engaged with that kind of conversation to say, how do we make sure you're leveraging what you already own? A lot of our customers, quite honestly, own a lot of technology that they may not be super focused on. They may not realize that, hey, by the way, just because you have Microsoft 365, I didn't know I had Intune already. You, you mean I already have Intune? Yeah. And how do we help you? You, you just aren't using it because yeah. you don't know you have it. Right. I mean, you mean I, I actually have an MFA solution built into M365? I, 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 did, I didn't know that. Well, well yeah. I, I have conditional access policies that I can already fire off. Well, well yeah. This is almost like, I tell people this, this is kind of the bad thing about it. And, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. In the M365 world, it's almost like an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's like sometimes there's too many choices. There's too many things that we're offering because we offer not only productivity, but employee experience, collaboration, as well as all the security stuff. So all of a sudden now, things like Intune might not be something that, you know, as you're talking to your, you know, your artist representatives or maybe a Microsoft representative, they may not spend an hour on it. You, you may hear about it maybe as, as a passing conversation because until we start looking at it from how we how we need to get you prepared, uh, it, you know, we're not just going to come out there and throw products at you. What we want to know is what's important, what's, it, what's, what's burning down right now, and how can we help you with that? And then we take baby steps. We crawl, we walk, we run. And so one of the things I tell people is this. There's a lot you might already own. There's things that artists could come in and help you discover. Like, did you realize your license for this? Let's turn this up. Let's let let's run a proof of concept. Even though you already own it, let's proof of concept it with, I don't know, 25, 30, 50, 100 users, whatever it might be. So there's there's a there's a situation here where I tell people this. Nobody in nobody no executives are out there going. Yep, I need to decrease my posture. I need to be less secure. And, you know, I've got tons of money that I can spend on this. You know, you've got a blank check. No, nobody's telling us that. Now, the issue always comes around to this. I mentioned before, big, big issue is strong authentication, compliant, trusted devices, adaptive policies. As I mentioned before, we talked about, hey, if I can, if I have those gold coins and I can create a, a label and a classification on them, I can then figure out what is the context and risk. Okay, if I lose a huge gold coin that's a six inches thick, that's a lot of money. If I, if I lose a tiny one the size of a chiclet, and for those who don't remember chiclets, they're the little tiny gum square. A little bit bigger than a Tic Tac. I think yeah. those are still around. You know, what's the what's the level of exposure? Well, yeah, I could, you know, I'm not going to cry if I lose the little one, maybe. I might be sad. If I lose the big one, I'm really sad. Oh, yeah. And I'm in big trouble with my executives. Um, and, and also one of the things that, that I think is important, and I use it on the right-hand side, it's called life cycle, access life cycle. Remember, I'm pushing for you to understand zero trust, which means assume that there's going to be a breach at some point in time. Therefore, you do explicit identity and you only do access as needed, just in time, just enough access. That is a life cycle. That's not a one and done decision. That might be a dynamic decision. That might be a decision, again, as I mentioned, based on your policies, as well as based on what's happening in the business. Now, hey, here's a clue. People change jobs. How many times when a, people, when a person changes a job in your organization, do you have a security assessment scan that says, okay, Phil used to be head over XYZ. Now he's moved over to the ABC group. Well, guess what? There's plenty of stuff in the old XYZ group that he probably doesn't need access to anymore. OK, so that's at least time bound it, access bound it. Maybe it's read only. Maybe it's no access. I have to make that decision. I will tell you this. There are there's companies I've worked for that when I moved around in the company, I realized I still had access to all the same systems, all the same data that I had before. And it was probably some information that maybe I didn't need to have. It wasn't anything super secret. It was just there was no need to know basis there. So I, a, I have gone and done assessments at networks and like sitting with the administrators when we're pulling up and we're doing, okay, let, let, let's do an audit and see like who actually yep. has admin access. And it's like, who's that? 
Oh, he right. left like he left like six months ago. Who is that? I, I don't even know who that person is. I don't even know that is. person. Yeah. <laughs> like they, they must have left that, before I even started here. That is so that is so that is so common. I, I and it's not a, a knock against anybody. We get busy, and the problem is we get busy and we say we'll get to it, or we just don't even think about it. And that's why I mentioned before, okay, I'm not going to go over this so many times. There's a there's a number of different ways we could do strong authentication. Fido I, keys. I have Fido keys. Yeah, Fido keys, um, Windows Hello, Card like I, I used to use push notifications because, like, that was the, initially, that was the, hey, here's, here's at least a way. Um, personally, I would say try to get away from push notifications. Yeah. Because there's a thing basically called sim jacking, I think is the the correct term. Um, Someone can go to your phone company and basically say, essentially, I lost my phone, I'm buying a new one, here's here's the phone number, they can take over your phone number out from underneath you. And so if the way that you do your two-factor authentication is password and then it sends your phone a text message, well, they're getting that text message now. Exactly right. Instead and of you. So now they are like you because yeah. they had your cell phone number. Having having an an authenticator app, something where you need the, the biometrics, any of those those top ones yep. definitely are the there's a whole lot more that you have to have or be to actually be able to do that unlock. Like my FIDO key, if I lose I, I have two. If I lose both of them, um, I am going to lose access to a lot of stuff. Exactly. Um, that, and that's why you have two, so that if you lose one, you can get a second one and start pairing things up with the new set before yep. you lose the second one. Before you lose, exactly right. And I think one of the things, um, you know, in the old days, the olden times, you know, we we used to have, you know, these hard tokens that you carried around, key fobs you could carry yep. around. They would have like a random number generator that would be synchronized up. And so as long as you typed in your username and your password and your password plus six digits uh, off of the token or whatever, you know, yep. uh, that, that was that was good enough. And that was actually the first multi-factor authentication mechanisms that were put in place. And I tell people this, please be aware that you have to extend this. You have to stay one step ahead and having multiple choices of these. Like, for example, if you did lose your FIDO key, maybe there's an opportunity to have a secondary multi-factor authentication. So you can have these stacked. And by the way, you could trust one multi-factor authentication mechanism more than another. Like, if, yeah. for example, if you had to go back down to, um, you know, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send you this, uh, I'm going to make you call into the system and type in the number you see on the screen or something like that. That's, you know, yeah. that's possible, but it might be the last resort or something like that. I've got FIDO, Biometrics, Microsoft Authenticator. I've got um, the one-time passcodes. Like, if you lose both of them, like, here's two passcodes you can use, and that'll at least get you in so that you can set your up your your new keys up. Right. Um, but, right. yeah, and that's – so more and more, um, the – services that we use online are allowing the use of these multi-factor authentication devices to be able to prove that you are who you say you are yeah. with the device that you're using so that it's not just username and password or username password and i'm going to send your cell phone a uh, right. push notification uh, the vpn that i use actually sends a verification through Microsoft Authenticator. Hey, yes, you use your username and your password, but this is a device that we don't recognize. Please open up your Microsoft Authenticator app, which then I have to have my phone and yep. be able to unlock it It'd to then unlocked. put in the code that, so it is it is enough layers that like, it's a really bad day if someone can actually do all of those things and impersonate me. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a, and that's a point where those access policies like we talked about, that's why I jumped to this slide, because we want to be able to say, you know what, it's not a, it's not a, a, a binary zero or one. Like I mentioned before, it's not everything off, everything on. 
it is a situation where it becomes adaptive and that conditional access you know it could be as i mentioned before it could be the the, the sign-in capability the user capability where the device is uh, whether the device has the current you know a current patch on it you know if you're not at ios level xyz i'm not going to let you access this whatever it might be it could be whether it is a platform like for example if it's a certain platform uh and, and it's uh for example maybe it's not a trusted device from the device state i make other access determinations so these controls over here for example are allow limit uh force uh, an mfa uh for example if we've got a situation where you you mentioned before which is hey i had to come in through kind of the side door and pinky swear that i'm, I'm who i am uh, I couldn't do all the things. I, maybe I didn't have my FIDO key or I lost them all or whatever. I could put you in the vestibule. <laughs> That's an old term as well. I'll put yep. you in the vestibule. I, I, I'll, I'll trust you at this point, like the lobby. Uh, but I'll have a kiosk out there that says you must reset your password. And so I make you go through that before you do anything else. So I can go through additional steps. This is really kind of the, the, the process here. I know this sounds con, you know convoluted, but as you start to think about it, one of your one of your biggest uh, assets. One of those biggest gold coins is those users' identity and that user access. As I mentioned before, once I become Phil West and log in, I am Phil West, and I can go and and masquerade, do whatever Phil's got access to do, social engineer as if I am Phil, and probably gain additional levels of access just by knowing how to work the system. So looking at this, one of the things that, that we want to do is to also bring together the fact that we've got multiple entities, multiple clouds. We're not assuming everybody uses Azure. We've got AWS, we've got Google Cloud, we're looking at Azure. We know there's all kinds of endpoints, iOS, Windows, Mac, Linux, Androids. We're wanting to say, how do we create a policy that allows for, for a structure with all this flexibility? Would it bring your own cloud, whatever you want it to be, Bring your own device, whatever you want it to be. Use a corporate device, have a standard, buy MacBooks and Surface devices, whatever they might be. And then how do we wrap a policy around all of that so that we can secure that? One of the other things that's crucial to this is also is how do I look at, all, at my posture? How do I monitor my posture? So we actually have a couple of different things that, that, are in, that are important. We have what we call the XDR solution which is we have Microsoft 365 Defender. That's like a portal that looks at all the Microsoft 365 signals. When I say Microsoft 365, I mentioned before, we've got this huge portfolio. So you've got situations where we're protecting your mailbox for email, that's one, one level. We could be looking at all the applications that are running on your network, who's using what, and trying to determine what is your SaaS posture, what are all the applications that are out there and where might there be risk. Um, I mentioned identity usage, like, hey, Phil has total access to get in, but let's say Phil tries to log in from a, one network, one IP address, uh, and then he starts doing some things that just aren't normal. I mean, he's, he starts like scanning other machines, trying to do remote logins to other machines at, again, two o'clock in the morning on Sunday, and that's not Phil's normal habit. Um, so there's things like identity protection there. There's endpoint protection where, again, we say assume breach. If you have a Windows machine, Mac, OS, Linux, uh, we're also looking at Android and iOS from the mobile perspective, having an endpoint protector on the machine, actually having an agent on the machine that says, hey, even though we're trying to stop all these things, we have to have a backstop. Just like in baseball, you got a backstop. You know, pitch, if the catcher can't catch it and it doesn't hit the umpire, <laughs> Then you got a backstop. <laughs> so it's kind of a situation where we want to make sure we have we create these backstops. And you know, that's what Defender for Endpoint does for us. And that that's actually part and parcel of what we call our Azure Defender portfolio as well, which extends that into your cloud. So if you've got uh, cloud applications, test development, uh, virtual machines that you're running, having all this put together so that you have visibility there. And then, and then actually pulling it up one level, excuse me, sorry about that, pulling uh -huh. it up one level to say, you know what, I have a SIEM solution. A SIEM is actually kind of the grand catcher of logs, events, incidences, and meshes them all together. And what that actually means is I can pull information from the micro, Microsoft ecosystem, so M365, your Azure pieces as well as Dynamics, 
But I can also go to any other security portfolio system. So let's say you have other security applications that can report up to a scene. You have Azure Sentinel capabilities sitting there that can actually look at all of these. So M365, Azure, other tools that report up. Uh, I'll use Salesforce as an example before. If there's Salesforce resources, you want to pull up, you want to know who's accessing what account, what level of account, how often are they hitting a record, does it look like they're scanning records, whatever it might be. You have a, you have a, a seamless solution in Azure Sentinel that allows you to catch that information and then really start weeding through the noise. What would, what would happen here is we have an administrative team, a security team, and they're getting bombarded with tons and tons and tons of log messages and they can't read them. No human can read them. Same solutions are actually kind of designed to say, hey, let's weed through this, do some correlation engine on it, figure out if we can determine how these fit together in, into an incident, and then give that back to our, uh, our, our SOC administrators, our security administrators, and let them use it. And I know we've so, got just a few. Yeah. Go uh, I was going to say, this actually look, if, if you would be um, open to turning this into a mini series, Sure. Um, next time we can hit that transform employee experiences, deep dive <laughs> into that, and the Absolutely. customized secure access for all user types because we got about halfway through. Yeah. Um, so I think here's a good spot um, to to break. Sharice, if you if you think that we can we can set one of these up, um, then we can we can do a, a part two. Um, so if if you are in attendance or watching this as a replay, um, send in questions. Um, I am S Simmons at artalist.com. Um, we can address those questions at the beginning of our next uh, session that we're going to do. Um, if you feel like you are ready to start taking um, steps to start making your organization more secure, um, you can schedule a free consultation and we will get the ball rolling. And e actually, even if you feel like you aren't ready yet, because um, that, that's something Phil and I have talked about before, is knowing when that line is. Um, even if you don't feel like you're ready, uh, you should still check uh, check it out. And um, we'll meet you where you are and help you get started down the path of replacing uncertainty with understanding. Um, you can reach out to us, artalist.com. Uh, again, I am S. Simmons, uh, S. S I M M O N S at artalist.com. Um, send in those questions. We'll make sure that we actually hit those because we are at time. Um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's schedules. I saw a couple of pop ups on uh, on your your screen, Phil. So I know you have another meeting to jump to. Yeah. Um, but this this was this was great. Absolutely. And I, I greatly appreciate everyone's time and attention to this. Uh, this just goes to show that when you start talking about security and securing hybrid work, uh, it's it's pretty easy to expand the topic and it's really hard to kind of distill this down into a, a short presentation. I, I, I would tell people this, I would have made this a shorter presentation if we had time. So that's it's kind of a situation that, you know, unfortunately, it's really hard to kind of squeeze all this together. So I appreciate everyone. If you guys are up for a, a, another part two of this, please let us know. And I think it'd be a good a good session going forward. And I do appreciate your time and I appreciate your business. And thank you for joining us today. Charissa, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you everyone. Um, I will be sending out follow-up emails with today's recording as well as information on part two. If you have any questions, uh, you can email us at marketing at artalist.com and you also have Seth's email at simmons at artalist.com. If you're looking to schedule your free consultation, you can do that at www.artalist.com. So thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time at the Artalist webinar series.